Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, give us your Holy Spirit so that we might rejoice in your word, uh, your truth, and your kindness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, the life of Jacob with Luther. Uh, we are in chapter 27, verse 30. I'll take you there in just a minute. Uh, but just to recap, so we had the birth of Jacob and Esau, twins, born. Uh, we had the promise given, Luther says from Seth, right? Uh, but the promise given that the, the younger, the older will serve the younger. And so the, um, we have now the promise that Esau will serve Jacob. But remember that the, the whole arrangement is that Esau is basically, even though he sells his birthright and everything, he has this great um, priority in the whole family. The, the only one really who's not holding to the priority of Esau is Rebecca. And, and remember that, um, that uh, uh, Luther gives us this, these kind of amazing insights. Number one, the centrality of that promise that the older will serve the younger, how the Lord reverses the order of things. And then, and then second, how, um, you know, we normally think of Jacob as the sort of, I don't know, he's the homebody, he's the mama's boy, and Esau is the really manly kind of guy. Jacob is the deceiver. Esau is the one that is, you know, the hunter. We have that kind of picture. And Luther challenges us there and says that Jacob is the one who is, um, the student who's who's trusting in the promise, who's studying the Lord's word. And Esau is the one who's more worldly, concerned with the things of this life. And so the deception, and we'll get into this more today in the text. Uh, the deception is, uh, oh, here's this. I can't, uh, I got to kick this guy out. Don't click that note. Uh, this is always, how, do, how does it happen? This is the problem when I'm, let's see, what is the guy's name? Joe Otter has to be booted. That's a real hassle. Sorry, don't click the uh, uh, link there. How do we get this guy out of here? Remove report. Okay. Uh, sorry about that, guys. If you if you see links in the, in the chat, uh, don't click them unless they're from me. That's just a general rule. So, uh, uh, so Jacob there is um, is the one who has this promise from God, and Esau does not. And so the the favor goes to Jacob, but Esau now is angry. So we're we're in the in the throes of all that sort of stuff. And and so this the kind of picture of who's the good guy, who's the bad guy. Luther's going to press us on that as well. So I think that's a setup. So if you guys are ready, and of course, if you have questions, uh, please put them there, but let's, uh, let's get after it and, uh, and see what there is to see. Uh, chat, I gotta move that over here. I'm gonna see if anybody's in the waiting room. Okay, so Genesis chapter 27, verse 30. Now it happened, as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, so we're at this point now where, um, you know, Jacob had come in. You'll remember that uh, that Rebecca had dressed Jacob in the vestments that are there. Uh, the priestly garments uh, had brought him in, and and the and Jacob had given this great uh, Isaac had given this great blessing uh, to Jacob. Cursed is everyone who curses you. Blessed is everyone who blesses you all this so that that promise is given to him so that Jacob now has the promise. It's not only the, um, it's not only the birthright that Esau sold to him earlier, but it's also now a blessing that this promise that the Lord gave to Abraham, your um, seed will bless the earth. Now it's given to Isaac. Now it's also, now it's also given to Jacob. Uh, and so this pro this great promise has continued on, and then they clear out, and then Esau comes in, and you know he had 
he had gone hunting and because that's what Isaac said, go hunting, bring me some food. I'll give you, I'll give you the blessing. So it set up this kind of the feast and the big celebration and everything. And so now Esau comes in and as it happened, as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother came in from hunting. <laughs> so it's, I mean, this is big drama. It's the kind of thing where you would, you know, if you had a movie about it, this is like, oh, this is the. And he comes in and he's made, he had made savory food and he brought it to his father and said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game <laughs> that your soul may bless me. Eat of his son's game. Notice how uh, I, I didn't notice this. Luther pointed it out for me, but how Esau is going to refer to himself in the third person. <laughs> Just really, <laughs> so your soul can bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, who are you? <laughs> in other words, he just thought that he blessed Esau. I'm laughing, but you got to believe that nobody here was laughing. He thought he blessed Esau. And the one he thought was Esau left. And now Esau comes in, oh, who are you? Who are you? And he said, I'm your son, your firstborn, Esau. So uh, Isaac trembles exceedingly and says, who? Look, uh, you know, look at this here, how, remember, I, I've got, I think I've got the New King James pulled it. Yeah, remember in the New King James, um, if the word is, is needed to help the meaning in English, it's added. So in the if the Greek and the Hebrew aren't there, the English sometimes will add it. But the New King James indicates that additional word by italicizing it. So who you, I, your son, the, the am is unneeded in the Hebrew. But look at here, where is it, it, and it's, it's uh, the language of Isaac, of Isaac here is, bah, yeah, ha, woo. Who, where, hunted, brought it, me, I, ate you, came, blessed. Ah, ooh, ah. He's just trying to sort out what's going on here. And then, indeed, he shall be blessed. I ate of it before you came, and I blessed him. And indeed, he shall be blessed. And so Esau heard the words of his father, and he cries with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and says to his father, bless me, me also, oh, my father. So here Esau comes in later, and they realize that the Lord had given, or that Isaac had given the Lord's blessing to Jacob. Okay, if you guys have questions about this, please, or insights about them, please uh, put them in the chat. But let's uh, uh, click over here to the other side and see, uh, see what old Luther uh, is going to take it, take us into it. So when the blessing had been finished, <clears throat> a lamentation and altogether different blessing of, es of Esau followed. So the blessing of Isaac is finished now. So we have a different blessing for Esau. And this is the second part of the account. The words of Esau's speech should be carefully considered for Jacob had not said in the third person, let my father arise, but rather sit up, I ask you. So so Luther's noticing, and again, I didn't notice this, but Luther's noticing the different way that Jacob talks versus the way that Esau talks. Jacob says to his father, sit up, I ask you, eat this food. But Esau comes in there with this sort of pompous, let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that your soul may bless me. And Luther comments on that, the hypocrite, that hypocrite, Esau, employs unusual rhetoric, just as the saints of this kind are wont to employ words that are suitable for adornment, refinement, and show. <laughs> this is this is an interesting thing. I, and I hadn't, again, I, I, I hadn't noticed it, and I, I hadn't really thought about this, but you, you'll notice this sometimes, that when, um, that, what are the words that a person is using? Are they, are they just, are they speaking plainly or are they um, kind of giving you all the fancy adornment? 
and and it's one of the marks for Luther of really kind of of truthfulness or of character or of spiritual health that the Christian is just going to talk plainly. The Christian is just going to say what's true and not going to try to make it. I got to try to make it fancy. See, uh, uh, the man makes use of rhetorical amplifications. That's uh, Jacob. I uh, sorry, Esau. Uh, Esau makes use of rhetorical amplifications that would never have entered Jacob's mind. Let my father arise, he says, eat of his son's game. This is how he proudly rhetorizes, which I did not know was a word. It is as though he were the sole and only begotten son, <laughs> his son's game. But Jacob was not a son, for such is the way of hypocrites. They call themselves church and have greater mask and more splendid dress than those who are truly godly. But in the godly, there is neither so much boldness nor splendor. This might be one of the, I mean, if we, if, if we want to rightly understand uh, Luther's idea of the theology of the cross, this might be one of the places to, to, to think of it. In other words, how do we recognize where the true church is? is is it is it is it recognizable by the outward splendor and pomp we were in rome in july and it is an amazingly pompous place i mean it's over the it's just it's incredible really i mean it's uh you can hardly imagine the size and the scope of all of these things. And St. Peter's Basilica was there. In St. Peter's Basilica, they have, a, they have a plaque in the ground where all the other basilicas in the world would end, right? So like if you're in Rio de Janeiro's Basilica, that you, you, know, you can go in St. Peter's Basilica and find the plaque where your basilica comes to an end because it's the greatest of all the churches. And, it, and the sort of splendor is there. Here's the church of designed by Michelangelo, this all this kind of stuff. And and that's um, what that sort of draws you in. This is the thing with Esau. But but Luther says, look, this kind of boldness, this kind of splendor, God, the, the, the godly have a degree of humility, and bo both in the way that they speak the way that they act. Um, Pastor Kernander, hey, says in the chat, while they parade with outward show, they lead the people to and fro in errors maze astounded. From that great Reformation Luther hymn, O Lord, look down from heaven. It's great. Um, So much. Uh, Tammy says the, the the size of the churches in Rome versus the way that the churches were in Germany is a contrast as well. Although I I think that's true, but it's it's hard to get the contrast because they're in Germany they're pretty fancy too. It's not bad to have a beautiful church. We have to remember that if the beautiful church burns down, and the people of God are meeting in the basement or in the backyard, the beauty is the beauty is in the Lord's word. The be, the, the, that, that's where the true gifts are. So, er, so Jacob does not have the courage to accost his father so arrogantly. Here, Moses makes no mention of the robes. Nevertheless, Esau undoubtedly wore them. So the idea is, remember, uh, up, a, up here, Luther was talking so much about the adornment of Jacob. He was in the priestly robes. Uh, Esau must have put those robes on, Luther guesses here. Again, his guessing. Uh, perhaps Re Rebecca secretly put them back in their place. She was no longer concerned about keeping or watching over them. She thought, let them go for all I care. Let him clothe and adorn himself as rhetorically as he wants. My son. That's how uh, Jacob has already obtained the blessing. Uh, let's see. Michelle says, in the charismatic tradition, you might say that the words are like clouds without water. Chris Roseborough might call it a word salad. Lots of fluff, a show of authority. Word salad. That's nice. That's nice. Got to see old Roseborough this summer, too. That's great. 
So verse 32, his father Isaac said to him, who are you? And he answered, I'm your son, your firstborn Esau. Isaac trembled violently and says, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate before you came and I've blessed him. Yes, he shall be blessed. So we'll see it, Luther, here. Here he begins to lie deliberately. So the he there is Esau. Um, Esau begins to lie deliberately. He uses words that are truly impressive and high sounding. I, he says, am your firstborn son. Remember, forgetting conveniently that he sold his birthright to Jacob for the pot of soup a number of years ago. He makes his speech uncommonly expansive as befits such an order. Jacob is a simple dialectician. In the eyes of Esau, he's completely contemptible, despised, accursed. He does not deserve to be called Isaac's sons, much less the firstborn son. But the Holy Spirit has decided that the opposite is true. Jacob already has the blessing. You, Esau, are by no means the firstborn. Have you not forgotten? You have for you have not forgotten, have you, what you did when you said, I'm about to die. What use is the birthright to me? Give me the pottage. And he sold his birthright and went away after he'd eaten. And he despised it, considered it worthless. The Holy Spirit has not forgotten this, as you dream. If you sold it to your brother, you have been justly condemned. Therefore, you are lying when you say that you are the firstborn son, for you squandered the birthright when you ate the pottage and cast it aside with extraordinary contempt. God wants to be glorified for his favors. This is a, actually, whoops, what did I do? There we go. God wants to be glorified for his favors. This is an incredible theological point here. And the person who honors him, he glorifies in turn, but those who despise him shall be lightly esteemed. First Samuel 2.30 states. So God wants to be glorified for his favors. We should, that, that favor sounds fun to us. I think it's funny to us. I think, I, I think we could just understand it this way. God wants to be glorified for his gifts. Hmm. This is, it's not, there we go. For his gifts. Or, or maybe we would say it theologically, God wants to be favored or God, or God wants to be glorified for his grace, for, 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 his, for his kindness to us. And that's why um, he glorifies the one who honors him, because what is the honor that we show to God is faith. That we, we say, hey, uh, Lord, we look to you. Oh, boy. I think Zoom has updated itself. And so when I try to draw, it just shows a. Mm, uh, I've got to draw bigger. Faith. So that so that God wants to be glorified in this way, that we look to him for good. And that that honoring of him is. Um, is what he's looking for. Which is different than what we think, because we think what the Lord is looking for is. Um, obedience or service or um that uh that we that the that are that first our actions are compelled by his words but the lord is interested in the heart that our heart is compelled by his promises long before our hearts and minds and hands are compelled by his commands. So this is a horrible example of the statement, horrible because it's showing the opposite. It's showing how Esau is, is standing before the Lord and before, and before Jacob with pride and arrogance and not with, and not with humility and with faith. But Isaac shudders and is stricken with great and violent dread at Esau's word, since he's afraid that perhaps by God's design, um, oh, here, Wendy, sorry, I see your question here. Wendy asks, what does the scripture mean by heart? I think the, hmm, right now, I think the easiest way to understand that is to say the inner life. So our will, which is our determination, our emotions, which is the kind of feeling, 
our own thoughts, which is that inner conversation, the whole inner life is what's meant by the heart. Probably if you were to separate, the conscience is also part of that inner life. That's that kind of reflection about the things that I'm doing and the things being done to me, if they're good or evil. That whole thing is the heart. Uh, that That's my best definition. I, uh, if you could, if you have a better one, then that, that would be great. Becky says, out of the heart comes all evil stuff. Yes, th this is the heart is um, the, the fall into sin has corrupted our heart so that now instead of the heart desiring the things that are good and beautiful and true, our hearts are naturally inclined towards those things which are, which lead to death and destruction and sin and so forth. So, so Jesus says out of the heart of man comes all evil desires and Stuff. So the, the heart, our, our hearts, which are th this kind of inner life that happens inside of us, which is to be directed towards God and things that are good, is instead directed towards what's curved in on ourself and all this kind of stuff. Matt says, Luther seems to be uh, despising the gifts of God as the same as despising God. You're yeah, right. Great point. Good. Okay. Uh, so Isaac shudders. And is stricken with great violent dread at Esau's word. This is no inconsequential dread, for he was afraid that that glory of the blessing, the kingdom, and the priesthood would be transferred from his house in accord with, um, in accordance with some plan of God. Thus, the same danger confronts him when Esau threatens his brother Jacob with death. The danger that if Jacob should perish, the blessing would be given to strangers. This is why it's interesting, you know, Esau is going to be so angry that he's going to plot to destroy Jacob. And Rebecca is interested in getting Jacob out of Dodge, but so is Isaac. Whew. So there, and, and there's other things involved as too, especially marriage, because now that Jacob has the blessing, the question is, well, he doesn't have any kids. Esau already has two wives at this point and jacob isn't married esau has all these kids and but the blessing is a generational blessing and now jacob doesn't have any any family nevertheless isaac is not indulged to change the blessing once it has been bestowed he says that whoever it is who sees the blessing is blessed and will be blessed since god's gifts cannot be revoked the gifts and calling of god cannot be revoked Later, however, he recalled the matter more carefully and thought, behold, I heard Jacob's voice. He deceived me by covering his neck and his hands with skin. Surely he's the one I blessed. So, so Luther says, Isaac at first thinks, oh, maybe I blessed someone who's not even in the family. But then he says, no, no, it had to be Jacob. So when Esau, I think I'm going to keep plugging along until you guys stop me with, oh, here's more intention. Could heart also show willingness to do what is pleasing to God, but still failing? Yeah, the Christian heart, remember, is transformed. So the Lord has taken our heart of stone and given us a heart of flesh so that now in the Christian life, there is this, this mixing, right? We, we still have our flesh, which desires and wants to do the wrong. But now we have also the spirit. Remember, we, we talked about this. Uh, no, guys, no doubt you guys remember all that we ever talked about. But remember the picture of the temple? that Luther uses to describe the human heart. Uh, so you have the outer court, that's the body. Then you have the temple, that's the soul. And then you have the, you have that or the heart. And then you have the, um, uh, the Holy of Holies, which is the spirit. And for the unbeliever, it's dead, it's dark. There's nothing there. But for the believer, the Holy Spirit comes and now our spirit comes to life. And the result is that um, we start to want and start to desire and start to, decide to do those things that are good son says sounds like king Saul and king david's story exactly even more so as we get going did jacob realizing he was a child of promise really just step up to take what was supposed to be his yes and that's coming also nancy says god's gifts cannot be revoked we can reject them hashtag wow nancy classic you're adding a baptism is not magic that's true I don't know what to do about the hashtags. That's kind of cool. Okay. So 
we're this the ir, the non revocability of the of the blessing is going to come up now. So, verse thirty four. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, even me also, O my father. So Esau is weeping now, realizing what's happened. And he said, your brother came with guile and he has taken away your blessing. <laughs> At this point, Luther says, the question is raised why Isaac did not revoke the blessing since Jacob took it away with guile. Lyra, or the Jewish commentator, who Luther studies quite often and is oftentimes reacting to, Lyra relates the opinion of the Jews that when Isaac heard Esau's complaint, he wanted to revoke the blessing. But then by God's will, he saw hell open and ready for him if he revoked it. For this reason, he was terrified and did not revoke it, but rather confirmed it. This is what Lyra says about the opinion of the Jews. These people, however, do not explain the words of Scripture, but rather obscure them. So the, the old tr Jewish tradition was that that Isaac was going to give the blessing to, uh, uh, to, to change it to Esau, but he saw a vision of hell and changed his mind. And Luther says, oh, come on. One should not imagine that Isaac, even though he was violently terrified, gave thought to a re revocation, for he knew that the blessing was an utterly permanent and unchangeable work and gift of God. And Luther's going to give some examples. This is kind of nice. Thus, when I give baptism to someone, then my heart and will are completely certain that I really want to baptize. But if he who is being baptized acts deceitfully, I, st I have still administered a true baptism which is not my own, but truly a divine work. So just like the blessing that the that Isaac gives to Jacob, so the gift of baptism. You can't take it back. You can't undo baptism. You can't say, you know, never mind. In this way, Isaac said, I blessed him, and he shall be blessed. And thus he has previously decided earnestly in his own mind and was not without special deliberation that he put it off to the end of his life. Therefore, he was certain that when he blessed, he was, he was uttering a definitive statement pronounced and confirmed by divine authority. And it was the same blessing that he had received by hereditary right from the fathers, from Adam, Noah, Abraham, the others. So remember Adam, the seed promise, Noah, seed promise, Abraham, Isaac. Now it's being handed down. This golden thread that runs through the scripture, that promise of the seed that will crush the head of the devil, that's, that, that is the blessing that's being given here. This is no trifle. This is no um, uh, kind of made up thing. This is connecting now the, well, Jacob, it's connecting Jacob to this long promise of God's gifts, to this string, this generational thing. Such statements cannot and must not be changed. For God does not change his gifts. He does not revoke baptism, absolution, and the other gifts he bestows through his word. If he forgives my sins, then they have been truly forgiven. Becky says, when a baptized person intentionally rejects God, will God continue to call and gather him? Yes. People also debate, <laughs> should I, the Lord is calling, gathering all. It's beautiful, actually. Uh, Pamela says, I wonder if Isaac trembled because he recognized in the moment that he had been going against the direction of God and should have been blessing Jacob in the first place. He humbled himself and submitted God's plan at this point. Well, that's a good question. And I, I, appreciate, I, I appreciate that line of inquiry also. I think that's, I think that could be right. People debate about the guile, back to Luther here, whether the saintly fathers acted with guile and whatever they, and whether they sinned by acting with guile. We've often heard that they lied inordinately, not only obligingly, but also actually 
<clears throat> I think this language here, by the way, can you tell? You're reading it like the, the, the idea of lying inordinately, lying obligingly, lying actually is probably an old, th th these are technical terms uh, connected to the conversation about the Eighth Commandment and what's a true lie and when are lies permissible and not permissible. We, 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 and the example that's given most often is the godly midwives of the Egyptians who did not murder the babies of the Israelites when they were being born. And that that lie was a good work, not a sin. So I think this has to do, I think these, these are technical terms that have to do with that conversation. And that's going to come up now. In this deed, so this is the deed of Jacob deceiving his father. There's no sin, says Luther. Although in the fact, so what he did, and in the sight of men, there is fraud and deceit. For Jacob deluded his father with his hairy hands and by covering his neck with skins. Yet, before God, it's not a fraud. Why? Because the primogenitor, so that's the, the firstborn, blessing of the firstborn, the primogenitor and the blessing, which had been bought from his brother and previously already had been divine authority, was owed to him. Now, why? So, number one, it was owed to him because of the promise of God, Genesis 25, 23. The older shall serve the younger. And remember, it's and amazingly, that promise given to Rebecca is the is the thing that's driving the all the drama here the lord had determined that the older will serve the younger and the question is who believes that promise who's acting according to that promise so not only did jacob have that promise the older shall serve the younger but then Isaac, esau went ahead and sold his birthright to jacob which had which already had reversed it so he had bought it from his brother previously and he had the divine authority so the bought, that refers to the pottage, to the selling of the birthright, and the divine authority, that refers to the promise, Genesis 25. It was destined for him in accordance with the prophecy which declared the older shall serve the younger. Consequent, so Jacob was owed the blessing by Isaac because, number one, God determined it and made it known in the promise, and number two, Esau had forsaken it in the selling of his birthright. And yet Esau and, and Isaac had now arranged things in such a way that they weren't going to follow through either with the promise or with the selling. They were going to deceive Jacob. And so the deceit was on the other hand. So consequently, to contrive a plot to take away from another by deceit, what God had given you is not a sin. And Luther will give now an example. Uh, thus, although the despoiling of the Egyptians, this is when the people of Israel were leaving Egypt is truly a despoiling according to human judgment. The Israelites did not sin by despoiling the Egyptians, since God had commanded them to say to the Egyptians, lend me silver vessels and clothing with which to adorn the feast of the Lord when they were intending to flee. They had God's clear command, which said, I want you to defraud to despoil the Egyptians. For the Egyptians owed the Israelites pay for their servitude and for the exceeding harsh tyranny. Yet this was surely an insignificant and poor compensation for such a long oppre op oppression of the people and for its slain children. So the uh, Luther gives us the example, the Egyptian despoilery. Is that a word uh, that's happening then? As a time when what, when what looks like a breaking of the commandment is in fact not a sin. When something looks terrible, but it is not a sin. This is how one should regard the fraud on the part of Jacob. For when the saints perpetrate a fraud and have a command of God in regard to it, although it is a fraud in the sight of men, yet it is a saintly, legitimate, and pious fraud. Therefore, there's no need to ask and debate in which way and whether Jacob sinned. One must consider that what he took away from his brother by fraud had previously been granted to him by divine authority. Thus, in their wars, the saints frequently deceive their enemies, but those are lies <clears throat> one is permitted to use in the service of God against the devil and the enemies of God. 
And now, are you ready for this? It's kind of amazing. Luther is going to give another example of this, of fraud. And it's going to be committed by Jesus himself. He's going to refer to this old picture that the church fathers used to use of Jesus being the, the worm on the hook. <laughs> and, and so that the Lord, to destroy the devil, puts the worm, Jesus, on the hook of the cross, so like bait, and the devil is deceived and tries to destroy him. So I, don't, I don't know if that, I'm interested to know if that if you've ever heard that preached or if you or if you're familiar with that image because it's an old old image from the church fathers but we don't we probably don't use it that much anymore uh but but here it is it's pretty amazing and then looking at the time we might finish we might finish here and then have some more conversation thus a fisherman deceives a fish by enticing it with bait you, the, you know the fish says oh look at this nice guy He's given me something to eat, a worm or a bug or whatever. And it was not unreasonable on the part of the fathers, the church fathers, to apply this picture to Christ. For he came into the world clothed in flesh and was cast into the water like a hook. After biting him, the devil was suddenly pulled out of the water by God, thrown onto dry land and crushed. This means that Christ presented to the devil his weak humanity, which covered that eternal and inconquerable majesty. Then the devil struck at the hook of his divinity, and by it all his power, as well as the power of death and hell, was overcome, as is stated in Colossians 2.15, which says, oh yeah, he disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them triumphing over them in him so it's a beautiful this is a beautiful text it's one of the texts where we talk about how um the death of jesus is the destruction of the devil satan could rightly have complained that he had been shamefully deluded and deceived a little bit of his own medicine since he has thought that he would kill a man and was himself being killed after being decoyed by him into a trick but by God's wonderful counsel, the same thing happened to him that is commonly said, that cunning might deceive cunning. That the great murderer is himself murdered in the act of murder. That the great deceiver is himself deceived in his great act of deception. Uh, and that death is swallowed up in death. That's how the Bible says. So, um, so Luther, now, and notice too, this is quite nice, how Luther takes the, this reflection on, you know, what is good and what's bad about what Jacob and Rebecca are doing. He's thinking carefully about it, sorting out what it means, and he's going to apply it now to what Jesus has done to destroy the devil. I wonder if there's a footnote here. That I wonder what would happen. I haven't, did not track this down. Um, Let's click this and see what happens. Oh, can we go there? It won't take me there. It just shows me the footnote. Luther's Works 26. Maybe we'll track that down uh, next week to see more of Luther on, on this metaphor in the church. Okay. Uh, so then Esau continues. We'll just set it up for next week. Esau continues. Is he not rightly named Jacob? He supplanted me two times. He took away my birthright. Behold, he's taken away my blessing. And he says, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Well, he didn't take away the birthright. You sold it to him, Esau, buddy. But he, his, you, you know, when someone's angry, they don't see things right. We know this not only in ourselves, but in our lives. And so the, all the fault is on Jacob. He only sees the errors and the things that Jacob has done wrong, not the things that he's done wrong. And he says, is there not a blessing? And so Isaac is going to give him a different kind of blessing. Um, it's not really much of a blessing. It's it's just a tiny little piece. And and the result is going to be Esau is going to hunt Jacob. So he's going to have to flee and he'll be gone for 14 years. 
but also his parents are going to have to plot to get him married because Jacob, remember, still doesn't have family. So we'll take up that next week. How's that sound? Let me just adjust this here. Uh, and then, so let's say a quick prayer, and then I will, um, uh, let me say, update on that. And then, and then we'll uh, stop recording and then have some conversation. Oh, Lord, we thank you that your promise of the seed uh, that would be born to destroy the devil is given to Abraham, Isaac, now Jacob, and fulfilled for us also in Christ. We pray that you would uh, strengthen us in this same confidence and humility and joy. For we ask it all through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. God's peace be with you.